Hello and greetings. I'm, uh, I'm Paul Lewis, the president of the Architectural League, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the League's 139th annual meeting and the first via Zoom, a format we have become fatigued by for collective communication, precisely because it is neither particularly collective nor is it necessarily very communicative. Nevertheless, uh, we are indeed in extraordinary times, times that present challenges to the very fabric of society, challenges to the city, challenges to democracy, and challenges to architecture, to both architecture's value and its agency. The cumulative crises of this relentless pandemic, the attendant economic collapse, ongoing global ecological devastation and climate change has brought into stark relief and exacerbated the immoral inequity in our economy, health and justice systems and laid bare the systemic anti-black racism in our society and in our architectural institutions. Needless to say, these converging crises will require action and perseverance, must engage us all and be sustained as the work of a lifetime. This is a time for transformation. The protests and the collective demands for a change are a window of, op uh, of optimism, and we must and we can move towards a better society. I truly believe that the League's role at this very time of converging crises has never been more crucial. As a vital independent organization based on fostering a vibrant community that engages difficult problems, the League is more important than ever and yet also has never been in as precarious a position. This paradox of isolation, the demands to be collectively distant, runs counter to our core beliefs about the qualities of culture, of density, of the city. The lifeblood and mission of the League is rooted in community, debate, and conversation. The League is the collective. It is all of you, and yet we cannot gather as we previously have. As recent spikes in infection rates prove, too quickly and carelessly renewing physical contacts actually extends the duration of the need for isolation. Distance will be with us for a long time and we have to adapt. Rosalie Ginevro, Anne Rieselbach, Mariana Mogilevich, Sarah Wessler, Anne Carlisle, Dan Chofi, Katarina Flaxman, Joshua McWerther, Katie Rotman, Nanase Shirokawa, Marla Carter, and Sam Velasquez have worked tirelessly to think how we adapt, how our existing programs can be rethought relative to these converging crises and to thrive online. Our mentorship program with students from City Tech and City College, Emerging Voices, League Prize, and the President's Medal with Andrew Freer, the Director of Rural Studio, and many other programs have all been reformatted in inventive ways, ways that Rosalie will discuss in more detail. We also need to invent new approaches and have launched the American Round Table and also the US chapter of Architects Declare, a global initiative confronting climate change. In addition, we need more programs that enable other voices to be heard. And I'm pleased to announce that next week the League will launch two parallel initiatives that draw on the power of observation, the creativity of the community to raise questions and frame debate about race, equity, biodiversity, public space, and rethinking architecture's possible agency. The first new program entitled Shifting Ground will provide a platform for visual reports that capture our changing surroundings during this unprecedented time. The second initiative entitled Reimagine will be a national conversation among the design graduates from the class of 2020 to frame the issues, questions, and potential approaches to COVID, climate, inequity, and racism. Both are formats for enabling space for multiple voices to expand our capacity to listen to surface critical questions towards future action. These programs don't rush towards design as a solution, but rather provide a basis for more structured projects going forward in the fall. Added to these challenges, we are also dealing with loss. The loss of a good friend of the league, Bill Manking, the co-founder of the Architects newspaper, and the loss of two life trustees, Michael Sorkin, 
and Christo, whose critical, insightful voice and unique ability to galvanize collective action, respectively, are poignantly missed right now. Because so many things are in flux, the nominating committee proposed a slate of continuity for the moment to work through the financial and organizational challenges, the radical change of having to rethink all of our public programming requires. As such, we'll have the capacity to expand to additional board members in the near future. We have received enough votes from you all to elect the following slate. Paul Lewis, President. Mario Gooden, Vice President for Architecture. Torquaze Dyson, Vice President for Visual Arts. Chris Graves, Vice, Fe Vice President for Photography. And Mary Burnham, Secretary. The class of 2023 includes Amal Andreas, Fiona Cousins, Leslie Gill, Stephen Hall, Rachel Judlow, Nader Tarani, Greg Pascarelli, and Mark Robbins. And the class of 2022 is Michael Beirut, Vishan Chakrabarti, Tucker V. Meister, and Tucker V. Meister. I am very pleased to announce that the board also designated Walter Chatham as a life trustee, which is an, an honor reflecting his years of creative engagement and his instrumental role in the league. Congratulations to Walter. As you all know, the, uh, the League would not be the League without the superhuman dedication and the ethical guidance of our Executive Director, Rosalie Ginevro. Rosalie has been leading how the, uh, leading how the League adapts and will now describe those programs and initiatives in more detail. Rosalie. Welcome everyone. It's great to gather together, even if we can't physically be in the same place right now. We can see everyone's name and it's encouraging and comforting to be with so many friends and members of the League. I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about the League's work than I typically do at annual meetings because I'd like you to know about all of the different things that have been going on with us. The staff of the League has worked very hard to help each other stay as even keeled as possible and to keep the League's programming animated and lively and supportive. In our versions of staff stay in touch sessions, you probably have them too, We've had a Norwegian lesson, a virtual tour of East Flatbush, and been introduced to the pleasures of group online crossword puzzles, along with a number of other adventures. And at the same time, some of us have become experts on the intricacies of Zoom or found ways to use already existing talents in audio recording in the service of the League. Thank you so much to Marla, Sam, Nanase, Katie, Dan, Sarah, Anne, Josh, Katerina, Mariana, and Anne for their hard work and good humor as we plowed through this time together. I also want to thank the board for their encouragement and support, and especially Paul, who's put in uncountable hours on league business, especially over the last four months, but also in the year and a half of his term preceding them. Keeping our institution going financially in the face of deep uncertainty about what the coming months and year will bring is a challenging proposition, as I'm sure it is for many of you. I want to thank the generous board members and others who've sped up their giving or made additional contributions and to say thank you to all of those who honored their pledges and earlier payments for the President's Medal Dinner, which of course ended up not being a dinner at all. Your investment in the League is already, has been utterly needed and deeply encouraging. I also want to thank as individuals a few people who traditionally only get thanked under the, under the umbrellas of their institutions. Courtney Spearman and Jen Hughes at the NEA and Kristen Heron at NISCA have been indispensable supportive partners, models of calm and good cheer and truly generous sources of help and advice. As you'll see with even just the quick collection of images to come, the League is beyond lucky to have powerful, beautiful graphic design I want to give a huge shout out to Michael Beirut, Britt Cobb, and their team members at Pentagram, who unfailingly make the work we present to the world look great. Thank you so much, Michael and Britt. So, to what the League has been up to over the last year. It seems so long ago, but last September, we had one of the best Beaux-Arts balls ever at Agar Fish Corp in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, with a stunning installation by Molly Hunker and Greg Corso of Sports and lighting by Ken Farmer. The 2019 ball was sublime. It is vanishingly unlikely that we will be able to have a 2020 ball, so we're looking for ideas for how to celebrate design creativity and raise money for the league. Please let us know if you have an inspiration. 
We also presented and launched about the same time as the ball, two programs that seek to encourage architecture students to stay the course in this very demanding discipline by showing them the variety of different paths that are possible in architecture through our student program, which you see here, which offers panelists and tours. And here's a shot of the audience at the student program and through our mentorship program with City Tech and City College, which pairs practicing architects with students an experience in which the mentors and mentees definitely learn from each other. This is a shot of um, a program in the mentorship program at Leroy Street Studio, hosted very generously by them um, in January, I think, of this year. We'll be issuing a call for mentors for the 2021 season in late August or early September, so please consider signing up. Here's the um, screen share or the uh, gallery view of a closing event for our mentorship program that we had about a week ago. Um, one of the, we also are launching this summer through the initiative of Katie Rotman on the lead staff and equipment donation program. One of the inequities that became visible with the transition to fully online classes was that many city tech students did not have access to adequate computer equipment to carry out their work at home. The League and City Tech are partnering to receive donations of surplus laptops that could be prepared for and used by City Tech students. Please keep an eye out for an announcement of the program in an upcoming League newsletter or contact the office at info at artsleague.org if you have a laptop to donate or would like to know more. Several of the League's longest running programs have moved online this spring in magnif magnificent fashion. Working with Anne Rieselbach and Katerina Flaxman, this year's Emerging Voices, who couldn't deliver their planned lectures in March at the Scholastic Auditorium, took up the challenge and produced fantastic digital reports that may even present a more distinctive, personal and atmospheric rendering of their work than lectures ever could. I strongly urge you to take in all of them on artsleague.org. Certainly one of the good things to come out of our intense new familiarity with the digital is the discovery of new ways of presenting work. And we expect that we'll have a newly de developed hybrid approach when we are able to go back to some amount of in-person programming. Look for the six winners of the lead prize to present their work on three Wednesdays in July. They're working with Anne and Katerina as well on an online exhibition. And there's a really interesting series of interviews with the winners already available on artsleague.org. Earlier this spring, Anna and Katerina worked very quickly with the editors of the journal Log to collaboratively create a program series on expanding modes of practice as a stand-in for the first Friday programs that became impossible to present. Expanding modes became three discussions moderated by Bryony e. Roberts on firms and people who are moving the boundaries of how to practice architecture. Mariana Mogilevich, Josh McWhorter, and Sam Velasquez continue to produce fresh and provocative material for Urban Omnibus, the League's online publication. This spring, to make the publication as responsive as possible to the quickly evolving issues that have claimed our attention, they started releasing new material each week and created a new series, Dispatches, um, which are audio segments that present conversations with fascinating individuals who are engaging the city in ways that range from leading tours through Prospect Park to founding a mutual aid network in Crown Heights to running an urban climate change think tank at the New School. There's so much good material on Urban Omnibus that once you dive in, you could find yourself occupied for a day or a week or even a month, and I highly recommend it. Last fall, we presented a series of lectures called Towards a New Architecture, Climate Change and Design, and all the lectures are on our website. And we have continued our work on climate change with the publication of a new series of interviews by Sarah Wessler, most recently with the environmental justice pioneer, Robert Bullard. Those also are all on our website. This spring, we started working with the great National Steering Committee of Architects to launch U.S. Architects Declare, part of a global advocacy effort on climate change, biodiversity, and social equity. We're working right now with the Steering Committee to structure working groups on carbon, biodiversity, and social and environmental justice, and we'll publish a further call for participation in mid-July. We hope you'll all join us in this important work. We are enormously excited about a new project we launched this spring, American Roundtable, through which we commissioned nine reports from teams around the country on what issues in the built environment are driving discussion and action and change in their location. 
will, <clears throat> excuse me, will have reports this fall from Alabama, West Virginia, North Carolina, Ohio, Maine, Texas, New Mexico, South Dakota, and Washington State. In early June, the League held an online celebration of Andrew Freer, who's the 2020 recipient of our President's Medal. The hour-long video of that event, including a great deal of information about the work of Rural Studio, many tributes to Andrew, a conversation among Andrew, Marlon Blackwell, and Billy Chen, and the magical presentation of the medal will be available on artsleague.org later this week. Earlier this month, the League issued a statement on racial justice and the imperative for action to change the long history of racist exclusion and complicity in architecture and planning. We're committed to working now and for the long term to move towards an anti-racist and just discipline in society. Thank you to League board members Mario Gooden and Mabel Wilson for their help with the statement we issued and for providing the list of resources that are available on the League's website. As you see, a great deal is going on at the League. As Paul put it very eloquently, the League is, in its essence, a community made up of all of you. Thank you for your engagement and interest, and we look forward to the coming year, which is sure to be full of struggles and challenges, and we hope pleasures and triumphs as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalie. Um, so last year, we, we rethought this very event to be focused around an annual meeting address. So this is a commissioned lecture by a leading figure in architectural practice, education, or theory who brings a distinct point of view to the question of what can, and more importantly, should animate architectural discourse and production now. A fantastic inaugural talk was given last year by Milton Curry, the Dean of the School of Architecture at USC. Earlier this year, we lost another dear friend of the league, Harry Cobb. And in thinking about Harry's accomplishments and practice as a great architect and educator, an insightful writer about architecture, and as a devoted humanitarian, we thought it would be very fitting to name the annual meeting lecture in his honor, as Harry was always thinking about what is important in discourse and production now. Before he passed, we let Harry know about naming this lecture in his honor, and he was very touched. He was also totally delighted that we invited Sarah Whiting to give the first lecture of what will now be known as the Henry N. Cobb Lecture. So it's my pleasure to introduce Sarah Whiting. Sarah is Dean and Jose Luis Ser Professor of Architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, a position she began a year ago after nine years as a highly influential Dean of the School of Architecture at Rice University. We are incredibly thankful to Sarah for giving us this time to speak about time as she is immersed in both significant personal and institutional challenges, challenges as she states, to form a better lived reality for everyone at the GSD. So please join me as best Zoom will allow in welcoming Sarah Whiting. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. There you go. And we go to, there we go. So um, thank you to Paul and to Rosalie uh, for inviting me here today. Um, thanks also to Dan and Katie for being our Zoom backup band. Um, more broadly, I'd like to thank the Architectural League for the League's long-standing role, 139 years is nothing to sneeze at, in leading important conversations about design writ large and today about racial justice more specifically. Your website has been a model in providing resources and starting conversations about this topic, and I'm sure I'm not alone in being grateful to all of you for it. So it's a, it's a true honor to be the Cobb speaker this evening. I really love this photo of Harry. In his expression, I find the intensity, the focus, but also the humor that so characterized him. So I was never Harry's student, nor did I ever teach under him, but we shared a conversation that stretched out over years. It took place in New York, in Cambridge, and at Rice, where I brought him to lecture early on in my tenure there. Harry and I shared a belief in the importance of thesis as a design, in a design education, we also shared a belief in schools being sites where conversations from different perspectives could be productive. 
We didn't agree on everything. When I invited him to talk at Rice about the topic of judgment, he said several times, constitutionally, I have a big problem with generalizations. Now, Harry may have had a problem with generalizations, but he had the patience to find specificity within them. Our many conversations over the years would go from big general topics like the role of thesis or theory in a design education to specific ideas and specific references to building types, to articles, to architects. As his extraordinary book, Words and Works, reveals, Harry trafficked in specifics navigating his way through a thicket of generalizations. Anyone who had conversations with him is the better for them, and I keep giving copies of his book to anyone and everyone in the hopes that his valuable legacy will live on. I'd like to hold Harry's call to specificity in our collective back pocket during this short talk this evening. So yes, this talk is part of a larger project of mine that really is, yes, about time. It looks at the topic of time and architecture. I'm interested in the slowness of architecture. And by that, I mean the slowness of the discipline and field of architecture that is the teaching and the practice in the context of the speed of the contemporary moment. And this is a Myra Kalman cartoon that I think captures the moment for everyone. It's sort of the perfect COVID cartoon of, of uh, a kind of Myra Kalman moment. Oops. Oh, wow, interesting. So Sanford Quinner wrote a terrific book called Architectures of Time, which looked at how modernity displaced any notion of absolute time and how the consequent shift to a culture of events can be tied to modern innovations. It's a valuable book, but it was published six years before the first iPhone. So what's the impact of today's temporalities upon architecture and design? I've, I've always liked this slide. In, in, so if, if Walter Benjamin uh, famously said that architecture is experienced in a state of distraction, just imagine what he would have said had he seen us with our iPhones. So some issues, first the Time's Up and Me Too movement and now the Black Lives Matter movement have recast the topic of time into one that is more urgent right now. That is the topic of architecture's broader constituencies, those who make architecture as well as those for whom architecture is made. I'll slip this in as a GSD dean, um, just to note that GSD students designed and silkscreened the, the Red Fist during the strikes in 1969. Harry was on the alumni board during those years, and we had some interesting conversations about the strengths of the st GSD students' impact during those strikes, but we talked mostly about his disappointment at the weakness of the school at that particular moment in time. And I think that that imbalance at the GSD in 1969, strong student activism, but weak teaching of design, speaks to a continued challenge for architecture. I'm not confident that we truly understand what it means to learn or to practice within this now expanded lens of our constituencies. In short, what it means to be political as architects. Architectural practice differs from most artistic practices in its scale, its complexities, its economies, and liabilities. It demands extreme generalism, and at the same time, extreme expertise across a spectrum that ranges from A to Z, aesthetics to zoning. Architecture has a temporality that demands patience. It's not the first responder of the arts world. Architecture requires collaborations that go beyond peers or even among those who share any affinities. Many of architecture's collaborations are obligatory rather than voluntary, and they're often highly imbalanced relations. Those, these are with contractors, with regulators, with community boards, with banks, with clients, all those who determine the rules and the budgets by and in which we operate. I don't foreground architecture's imbricated complicated status, either as a criticism or as an excuse. It's simply a given. It's a given that makes architectural practice already political, but it's also what makes it hard for any architect to act politically. That is, architectural practice is always political. Practice is a perpetual agonistic enterprise, but it's one where architects are almost always losing the playing field to dominant hegemonies. 
that is those with the power and those with the purse. And it's also why it's so hard to find allies on our playing field. As a quick example, I moved relatively recently to Boston from Houston, a city that's well known for its private philanthropic support of the arts. But despite that climate, there is in Houston a significant distinction between support of, or even interest in, architecture and the support of the other arts. Here's the home, for example, of a significant patron of contemporary avant-garde art, music, and film. I'm trying, really, to be polite. He's British. He's very polite. And I don't want to slander him, especially because he's been so generous to the arts. He's so smart when it comes to fine arts and music. How can someone who invests in this art and these artists be so conservative when it comes to architecture? I don't attribute this, this failure to stupidity. He's very smart. The field that is so hard for archi architects to practice upon is actually nearly impossible for patrons and clients to find, let alone to understand. And that's why so many architects respond either by producing the expected status quo or by retreating to paper architecture in drawing or writing or by reducing practice to artistic installations where the parameters can be controlled. These strategies all remove some of the agonistic players from the complexities of practice. Or it's why some architects respond with technical expertise, digital or material, that enables them to dominate some exchanges by gaining hold of the reins of capital that control our field. It's also why practice is such an absent topic from architectural education. Practice within a school of architecture can be idealized because the agonistic players can be very controlled. And while I defend that idealized model because it's so easy for the real world practice field to overwhelm even within school, I find the lack of pedagogy that pushes practice's boundaries truly a missed opportunity. Aspiring to draw the contours of a possible agonistic architectural practice that maybe, possibly, perhaps, shares, helps to shore up the, the role of the architect, I'd like to rely on three terms that won't come as a surprise to anyone who's familiar with my interests. The projective, judgment, and legibility. For architecture to be political, it has to have a project. A project, as opposed to a building, necessarily includes a critique, which itself requires a form of judgment. Judgment renders a project viable, but for a project to have an impact, it also has to be rendered visible, thereby engaging questions and strategies of legibility. In demarcating any space with its built forms, its walls to be specific, architecture necessarily creates definitions that include and exclude. It's from exclusions engendered by this demarcation that antagonisms can occur. The public design charrette, which has become a default means of gaining public buy-in for any project, offers a false promise of, of consensus for architecture, with the belief that colored pencils, magic markers, post-it notes, and red and green dots can offer a common language for the public to reach consensus on design. That consensus manifests itself either in remarkable banality, as we find in a number of public buildings like this post office, or in a buffet of possibilities, such as Tobotech and Bill Big's Superkiln project that attempted to represent everyone equally. Pointing out the heterogeneous pluralizing aspects of language, French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard reminds us, reminded us that such aspirations to community consensus are impossible, for language consists of an, employment de an infinite deployment of genres of discourse and modes of phrasing. As we all know, misunderstandings can arise when two speakers use the same word, but with different senses or different references or different inflections. This is what Lyotard calls the différent, or that which can never be fully defined. I love Lyotard's différent partly because I love the structure and precision of language and how that precision is nevertheless always paired with an equally beautiful inter inter indeterminacy of interpretation. 
we can turn to Alexis de Tocqueville for another analogy that might be closer to home. In writing Democracy in America, he warned of Americans' love for generalization. He never met Harry, obviously. An abstract word like democracy, de Tocqueville remarked, is like a box with a false bottom. You put in it any ideas as you please, and you take them away without their being missed. I would argue that it, oops, sorry. I would argue that it is within this combination of demarcation and indeterminacy that architecture's politics lie. Architecture's demarcations, its walls, its property boundaries, and its other limits define, but they nevertheless always carry a multitude of meanings. They are the built equivalent of Lyotard's différents or of de Tocqueville's boxes with false bottoms. How can these multiplicities be exploited to advantage so as to give architects more of a role on the playing field? I'll offer up two of WW's projects as a direction. The first is a project that's uh, one of our oldest projects um, that date, it dates from the late, late 90s. But I always return to it because I think it's the first project that actually defined our project. So this is the interest center a 40,000 square foot community center that had social services, adult education classrooms, a health clinic, food bank, fitness center, after school programs, library, auditorium, and gallery, among other programs. This was designed for a site in Lexington, Kentucky, where 90% of the people living in that part, that neighborhood of Lexington, lived below the poverty line. So this was a project that this, you can see the rendering from the, the late 90s. So it was a project that was adjacent to an elementary school. And the principal of the elementary school approached us and asked us to design a project that had this program in it. So it was this indeterminable length. There's a huge number of, of uh, programs that she wanted us to, to put into this building. Um, so we approached it by trying to figure out, well, if you have this incredible heterogeneity of program, how do you offer some legibility to this building? So we turned to a, a linguistic device. So I, I, coming back to my interest in language, we turned to the parentheses as something that offers a definition, but within uh, larger definitions or within other definitions of, of words. So we took the site, uh, just put a box on it, dumped the program in, and then put a series of, uh, of um, resin impregnated uh, plywood walls that would form these parentheses that would create definitions in the program. So essentially the parentheses offer different relationships across these different programs within the, within the building, offering a legibility that isn't tied to specific program but offers the legibility through the building nonetheless. You can see that the legibility depends on your inflection, depends on which programs that you're going to, you start to create relationships across the spaces as opposed to just defining them by rooms. And you can see the, the uh, basement, the ground floor, the third floor, and then the roof plan. So you can see these parentheses creating relationships across these many programs. The structure was very simple, just a pier and beam construction that allowed then for a big plenum that allowed air to circulate through the space. But the idea was that it wasn't the structure that created this identity, it was the, the uh, space itself. So this was a building, it was a community center proposal that was really sort of not familiar, you could say, as, a, as an architecture. And what we found very interesting in, in putting this project together was that in the community meetings that we had, people would say to us before we went to those meetings, oh, you should be doing a brick building, you should be doing something that would be familiar to the, this, this group. You know, they want a building like other people have. And yet we found that in our conversations with the community, they understood everything that we were doing. They were super excited about the project. And sadly, the uh, funding fell through, so the building was never built. But it gave us faith in the idea that uh, one should never make assumptions about a public audience, about your client, and certainly not about a community. 
The second project is the Kaiwei Exchange. It's a, a project housing resources for environmental, agricultural, tourism, and building and business interests. Sorry. Kaiwei is a small agrarian town of about 19,000 people outside Changsha, China, which is one of those metropoli of 7 million people. The aim of this project is to exploit urban and rural ties of benefit to the local agricultural economy while preserving Kaiwei's remarkable beauty and productive landscape of tea and flower plantations. So if the clients for the Intercenter came to us with a de detailed, lengthy program, this client came to us wanting a building for uses that were as yet unknown to her. Our response was to develop a pre-programmatic approach to the design of spaces, a means of catalyzing possible uses without predetermining what exactly might happen in them. We began with the most elemental of plan types, the perfect square, a nod to modernism's universal space. We then added a series of notched terraces and courtyards that bring in light while also modulating the floor plates, creating an entire array of rooms of varying sizes and proportions. And a nod to Harry, the generalizations of a pre-programmatic space only works through the incredible specificity of defining the size of spaces, the dimensions of radii, and other demarcations. The result is a collection of spaces and relationships that suggest a range of future use scenarios. We envisioned 100 variations, not as neutral spaces, but as, oops, no, not as neutral spaces, but as partial rooms and implied organizations. To return to the topic at hand, the topic of time, yes, architecture has a temporality that demands patience. Yes, architecture is a practice that is imbricated, complicated, and often imbalanced. But while we can't freeze time by idealizing uses, populations, or even contestations, we can shape spaces that create political possibilities by offering up spaces that help us to shape uses that we can't even yet predict. It's time, and as a nod to Harry, it's time to be specific so as to unleash the very indeterminacies that constitute architecture's political future. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for, uh, for articulating the instrumental role of the projective judgment and legibility and for demonstrating, demonstrating their role in specific architectural projects. And again, for giving us time to think about time. I should note that Sarah's lecture will be added to the League website, and we thank Sarah for that. And most importantly, I thank you all. You are, as I've mentioned, the League. Uh, I thank you for being here tonight, and I wish you all a blissfully screenless, or at least a Zoomless, 4th of July weekend. Take care, and have a great evening. Good night.